We're now going to talk about American women artists of the uh, 18th and early 19th centuries. One of the things you're going to find out is the women of a colonial America and beyond the colonial period uh, often became artists from financial necessity. Now, the, the colonial women artists became artists of financial necessity. Now, this had a very important um, restriction. They aren't becoming artists just because they want to create something new. Uh, they have to please the patron. And they have to behave as a woman might be expected to behave in many cases. Uh, so they need to be, as I say, in most cases, irreproachable in feminine conduct and demeanor. And they also often will be very conservative in their stylistic choices and in the subjects that they're uh, painting. What we're going to find is that many, uh, most of these uh, women artists in America are portrait painters uh, because that's a way to make money. Uh, some of them are untrained or uh, not, none of them are as well trained uh, as uh, well, except with one possible exception. Um, uh, some of them are even untrained, as we'll see. So I made a list here of Henrietta Johnson, Patricia Wright, Ellen and Rolinda St Starple, Sharples, uh, Jane Stewart, uh, and uh, Sarah Goodridge. And we're going to talk about three of these uh, artists. Uh, but all of these were people who, uh, because of financial necessity, uh, became artists. Um, in many cases, they were widows. And when your husband died, you know, today, you might say, well, the woman has to get a job. But it wasn't that easy. Uh, women of uh, middle class or uh, above were not expected to work. There were no professions open to them. So they had to be very innovative. And in this case, what they would do is take um, an amateur accomplishment, which would be painting uh, or you know, artwork, and from that uh, try to create a profession, a career. The first recorded American woman artist is Henrietta Johnston. Uh, and you can see her dates from 1670 to 1728. Uh, she was the widow of a clergyman in Charleston. And when her husband died, she had no widow's pension. Uh, she had no way to support herself or her children. And so she turned to pastel portraits. So you could say, in a sense, uh, following the lead of Rosalba uh, Carrera. But of course, she's not trained like this. Um, she is someone who had an amateur accomplishment. One of the things you have to realize is that this is the Americas in the colonial period. And so the standards for uh, artistic representation are not as high as they would be in Europe. So. When we look at Henrietta Johnston, who had no training in anatomy, uh, she did not have any professional training as an artist, uh, but she turned, as we say, an, an amateur accomplishment into a professional career in order to uh, support herself and her children. And she obviously pleased her patrons. Uh, because uh, the elite of Charleston society uh, would have her uh, do a uh, pastel portrait. As you can see, uh, the knowledge of anatomy is not as strong as you would find for a European artist. And this would be true of the male limners of the time, too. Um, they did have some art itinerant artists uh, going around and uh, doing uh, portraits. And we often talk about their primitive qualities. And, and one thing they would sometimes do is, is do the uh, uh, body and then go somewhere and paint somebody's head on it. Um, so the proportions were sometimes off. Now, Johnston is not doing that. Um, she is uh, painting these portraits. But as you can see here, we're looking at uh, Henrietta Charlotte, I don't know how you pronounce her last name, Chasse Tongier, uh, that uh, the face is modeled. Uh, the body seems very slight 
uh, in comparison to that. But there's a, a pleasant turn to the body. Uh, the coloring is attractive and uh, the people are being portrayed uh, as very, very genteel. And this is a way that she could make a living. The first American female sculptor was named Patience Wright. And she has a rather interesting story. Uh, she was a sculptor in wax. And so she's essentially doing wax works. Wax, you, you think of uh, uh, the wax museum and, and uh, um, this was the kind of things that she was doing. She was also a very um, unique person. <laughs> uh, she was a uh, Quaker and uh, the Quakers were not supposed to bow to royalty and they were supposed to use the familiar, uh, um, the familiar pronouns with everybody. There was not supposed to be this class distinction. So she's very outspoken, she's very eccentric. She calls everybody uh, thee and thou and uh, uh, would uh, do things like somebody would come in the room and she'd kiss them on the cheek and uh, you know, she'd just be very um, uh, Quaker and American, <laughs> very usual. Um, she went to England and she was, became very, very popular with high society, possibly because they'd never really seen anything like this before. And so they, uh, I guess, forgave her uh, their, her eccentricities or were just charmed uh, by them or saw them as um, perhaps uh, you know, the, the rougher American type. Um, and the way she would work um, is she would have, of course, her wax and she had a cushion. And if you see here, this is a portrait of her. Uh, we don't know who the artist is, um, but it's a, a portrait by an anonymous artist that's in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. And you can see she's got this big cushion on her lap. And the cushion was what she would model on. So she would be um, you know, having people over and talking to them, and she would be uh, modeling her wax and uh, uh, creating her, uh, her sculpture. Now, one of the neat things about her yeah, let's see, is that uh, she is reputedly a spy for the American Revolution. And so she's in England, uh, she's you know, at these uh, soirees where uh, some of the um, elite of English society are and perhaps let a few things slip. And so she's supposed to have written out these dispatches, dispatches and uh, hidden them in her wax bus, which were then sent back to America. Um, it's a wonderful story anyway. <laughs> um, and uh, she supposedly was able to send some, some uh, good intelligence back to the uh, uh, American revolutionaries. Unfortunately, most of her work does not survive. Uh, only one of her large-scale works uh, has uh, survived, and that which we see here is the portrait of William Pitt. Uh, now, she's using wax, and these are, uh, we say, waxwork figures, and then they would be clothed uh, in you know, garments, um, and probably the, the wig would be placed on the head, although she certainly could probably model the wig too. Um, and so this is uh, William Pitt, uh, and he has survived. I did find on the web a few very small works. These are small profile portraits in wax. Uh, wax, of course, melts, so um, you can understand why a lot of these would not have survived. Uh, one of them is George Washington, and the other is the Admiral uh, Richard Howe. Uh, profile portraits uh, that were uh, you know, considered to be good representations of the people. Jane Stewart is, um, has a kind of, in a, a way, a sad story. Uh, she was the youngest daughter of Gilbert Stewart, and she was just fascinated with artwork, and she wanted to create art. Now, her father you know, was you know, probably the most famous American artist of the time. Uh, and he gave art lessons to other people, including uh, other women, such as uh, Sarah Goodrich. But of his own daughter, he said, you know, she shouldn't be given art lessons, that if she were a true artist, she would just develop naturally. Well, we all know that's not true. 
you can have a lot of talent, but if you're not trained, you're limited in how far you can go. So she watched her father. Um, she may have done some assisting, you know, uh, but when he died, she was only 16. The family was destitute. Uh, Stewart had left lots of debts. And uh, although he was the premier you know, American painter, um, his debts outweighed his assets. And so Jane, once again, for economic reasons, became a professional painter in order to support herself, her mother, and her sisters. Well, the first thing that she's going to be doing, of course, is something that is very um, lucrative. And that is, she's got the Stuart name, and she's seen her father do his artwork. She has, presumably, his drawings. She's um, possibly even assisted him in some cases. And so she starts doing copies of her father's portraits of George Washington. And of course, uh, Gilbert Stuart is the person who is most famous for uh, portraying George Washington. Um, yes, the work is not as accomplished as her father, as you would expect. I mean, she's not really truly been trained. Uh, so here we see an example of Gilbert Stewart's George Washington with uh, Washington you know, holding out his hand. Uh, Jane Stewart has changed the pose a little, uh, but still uh, a very formal pose. Uh, George Washington in a study uh, with the drapery and uh, uh, columns in the background. Uh, also, uh, certainly one of the best sellers would be the uh, portraits uh, of George Washington following those. Uh, and as we said, Gilbert Stuart was uh, very famous for painting Washington, and Jane could turn out lots of copies. Now today, if an artist turns out lots of copies, unless they're a printmaker, um, people sometimes look down on that. But remember, there were no photographs uh, uh, readily available. Uh, so that this was the way that people could have representations uh, of their beloved father of their country. Uh, and it was certainly a lucrative thing to do. People would pay for these. Um, she also did work, um, and I don't have a, a lot of examples of that. Uh, some remind me very much of illustrations, and uh, there's, a, there's a softness about them. Now, I tried to take a photograph of this uh, from the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Uh, which is uh, Mary Magdalene in penance. So it's a very traditional subject. Uh, it is in an oval shape. And as you can see, my photographs, even though I tried to adjust the color on them, um, the, the lighting uh, and the film just didn't work. And they come out very gold and uh, way too dark. Too, there's, there is Tenebroso in this. Uh, the figure is lit. And there's a dark and shadowy background. So the small image here is from the museum website. And you can see the garment is actually blue. Um, I don't know if you can make that down at, at, in the detail. Uh, at the bottom, uh, there is a skull. And of course, uh, this is an image of Mary Magdalene uh, after the uh, resurrection and ascension. And her legend is that she goes out into the wilderness and uh, does penance uh, for her sinful life. And so she, the, the skull shows that she is meditating on death and mortality. Uh, the pose is, is uh, you say it's a traditional pose, but it does give you some action. Even though she's doing this bust length, uh, she's got the head tipped to one side, the hands that are ringing, uh, going in, uh, coming in another direction, sort of a balance of diagonal movement. Uh, so it, it's, it, it works. I also found this on the web. I was looking for Jane Stewart pictures, and it wasn't very easy. Uh, but this is a portrait. And this one shows, I would say, a great deal of accomplishment. Um, so uh, we can assume that as she uh, developed as an artist, uh, she was able to uh, do uh, more original work and more accomplished work. So this is actually from the 1850s.